we're going to talk about uh, the next part. It's it's out of order up here, but this is the next step when we're talking about significance tests um, for P and evaluating these claims of hypotheses and then running a simulation or and running a simulation and seeing how how possible or how probable is it that my sample actually got that particular value based on the null hypothesis being true. So when we do this. We always have to check our conditions. And so as you'll remember, my conditions here, conditions. So our conditions here, it's got to be random. So either they're going to say that or they're going to say it's a random sample or the, the, the sampling methods are going to indicate that it's a random sample. That's the first one. Also has to meet that 10% condition. So 10% sample has to be less than one-tenth of the population. And we've got to meet our large counts condition. And that would be our sample size times our proportion is greater than or equal to 10, but also our sample size times one minus our proportion also has to be greater than 10. So we meet that. Once we meet those, what we're going to do is we are going to then find that z-score that correlates to finding that actual p-value. And this is going to look familiar to you, and you can also use that uh, you know, normal CDF. But what we're doing is we are going to be evaluating area under curve, like we've been doing, right? So we've been doing this, and we've been taking time to find z-scores, find probabilities, those sorts of things. Got to have our labels here, and we're going to have... The, the p hat, standard deviation of p hat. That's why we need to do these conditions, right? Because we're going to be finding our standard deviation here. So we've got to do that 10% uh, condition so that we can find our standard deviation, which is going to lead us to a z-score, which is going to lead us to uh, our area under our curve. And so our z-score is going to be equal to, and this shouldn't surprise you, our sample proportion minus the population proportion over you guessed it, our standard deviation formula, right? And that is what's going to be labeled as our p-value. So these aren't really new skills here, guys. But we're talking about them in a different way because we're going to be using them in a slightly different way to evaluate versus that alpha level. And so where do we get these things? Sample proportion, we're going to assume that it's equal to our population proportion and our standard deviation formula. This is where we get our test statistics, right? Our test, test statistic. And then 1 minus P over our sample size there. That's where we're going to get our P value, guys. And so in this next problem, what we're going to do is we're going to set up our hypotheses. We're going to set up our hypotheses. We're going to find our P value. Then we're going to evaluate it against the alpha level. Let me scroll down. So in this problem, according to the U.S. Census Bureau, the proportion of students in high school who have a part-time job, who have a part-time job is 0.25. An administrator at a local high school suspects that the proportion of students at her school who have a part-time job is less than a national figure, so she would like to carry out a test at the alpha level significance of 0.05, significance level. The administrator selects a random sample of 200 students from the school and finds that 39 of them have a part-time job. So let's look at our appropriate hypotheses. So what is the claim from the entity? What is the claim that's going on here? That's going to be our h sub 0, our null hypothesis. Kind of look through here. The claim is that the proportion, the true proportion, is 0 0.25. That's the claim. The administrator suspects what? This is our alternative hypothesis. What is our alternative? Well, when we look here, suspects that the proportion at her high school at a part-time job is less than the national figure. So we suspect that it actually might be less than that. Okay? We suspect that it might be less than that. So notice, I didn't use p hat here. I used p because we're saying that we actually think that it's less than that. Explain why the sample result gives some convincing evidence. Well, what might be convincing evidence that it's less than? Well, they took a sample, right? What did the sample say? 39 out of the 200. So 39 out of 200 
our sample. So we said, oh, it's 25%. Well, 39 out of 200 is actually equal to 0.195. That's convincing because it's less than. So if the administrator had gotten 0.25 or had gotten more than 0.25, they might have convincing evidence to suspect the opposite, to suspect something different here from a null hypothesis. Well, what is their suspicion based on? What is their alternative hypothesis based on? It's based on their sample. Well, their sample was less than, so they're going to say, I think it might be less than. So we need to check the conditions to, uh, for the significance test. Let's see, is it random? Uh, let's see, random sample. We're not going to question that. We're going to say so random. And I'm going to put quotes, random sample. Check on the random sample. 10% condition. So let's see. Is 10% is 200 uh, less than or e less than one tenth of all students? In this case, um, let's see, local high school, we're going to we're gonna assume that's true. We know that for our school, 200 would be the majority, but in this case, we don't have evidence that suggests that the high school is small. It doesn't say small high school. It doesn't give us a population of the high school. So we're going to assume that 200 is going to be less than that um, there. And so let's then test our sample size times our proportion, which is 0.25. That's equal to 50, which is greater than or equal to 10. And then 200, our n times uh, 1 minus our 0 0.25 is equal to 75. So uh, that's equal to 150. Sorry, 150. And that's greater than 10. So that checks out. Our three conditions check out. Now, why do we have to do that? Well, remember, we want to do this because it's got to be random. It's got to be representative of the population. We want to do the 10% so that we can use the standard deviation formula. Why do we want to use the standard deviation formula? Because we're going to assess normality, and that's going to allow us to find probability under the normal curve using standard deviation as a measurement to find z-score. So let me scroll up. Now we're actually going to find out what is the probability that this happened, that this sample of 39 kids out of 200 happened by chance if the claim of 0.25% is true. So what we're saying is, let's just say that 0.25% is, is true. What's the probability that I got 39 just by chance? Because it could have happened, right? What if I just picked, it just happened to pick a sample with 19%? It could happen. But what's the probability that it happened? If it's very, very low, then we're going to say, ah, that claim, we've got evidence against that. No, that's probably not true. But if it's fairly likely, and what is likely, in this case, our alpha level of 5%, right? So if it's likely to happen, then we'd say, okay, it's likely to happen. I don't have evidence against the null, but it happened this much by chance. So it might be low, but how low? In this case, we're going to evaluate against the 5%. So let's see, calculate the standardized step test statistics. So let's outline some things here. I'm going to draw my curve in here because what I'm going to be finding is uh, the probability that I had 19.5% or less, or more extreme, right, or less, purely by chance. Well, it's normal, and we are assuming that our population proportion is 0.25, and so then we're going to figure out what our standard deviation is. Our standard deviation actually ends up being 0 0.03, okay, so our z-score and, and where did I get that? Well, remember, I'm going to write out my z-score z formula here. p hat minus p over the square root of p times 1 minus p over n. This is our standard deviation formula. So when we actually plug in some values here, we are going to get ourselves our p, 0.195, minus our population proportion over, and this is going to be Over 200. Okay, and so when we do that, we get 0 0.306 and on the bottom, and that's going to be our standard deviation there, right? So I'm going to outline a couple things here. And our 0 0.306. 
0 0.0306. And so when we do that, we end up with our 0 .3, 0 0.0306. That's what goes in here. That's, that's where I actually got that. But remember, our standardized test statistic, our z-score here, actually has that standard deviation in there because it's based on how many standard deviations away from the mean is, or in this case, our population parameter, right, um, is our particular uh, test statistic, our, our particular value that we got. What we end up with is, and remember, guys, I'm doing it this way, but you can do normal CDF, right? So if you do normal CDF, then you're going to evaluate this at, you know, for whatever parameter. So if you put in your mean is 0.25, your standard deviation is 0 0.03, your um, upper bound as 0.195. So that would be like a normal CDF. And you'd go, you know, like negative 999 all the way up to 0.195. You'd put in your mean. 0 0.25 to 0.03, and you'd have to do your labels, right? So this would be lower, this would be upper, this would be our mean, this would be our standard deviation. So you could do it like that to get yourself your p-value, your probability. I do it as z-score because this is going to remind us of what that test st statistic is. And so when we do it like this, it yields similar answer, same answer. Uh, if you go to table A, right, so you're going to get a slightly different answer, but that, that's going to be acceptable. Uh, on the AP test, if you use table A. So anyway, so so what we get is um, a z-score of negative 1.797. What's kind of cool is you can sort of see, is this outside the realm of reasonable, right? So if it's within 1.79 standard deviations, doesn't seem like our p-value would be that high, or doesn't seem like our p-value would be that low. It doesn't seem like it's going to be uh, crazy, but, but be careful of that. Be careful of that, because when we actually evaluate this, it's about equal to 1.80 which yields a p-value of 0 0.036. Remember, we get outside those standard deviations, we're getting under that 5%, right? And so 0 0.036, what does that mean? That means that is our p-value. So think back to the very beginning. Administrator takes a sample. 39 kids out of 200 ended up having a job. If it's true that it's 25% of kids have a job, my p-value, my sample from my p-value, the probability of my sample happening purely by chance, if it's true that it's 0.25, is 3%. So did I pick the one sample that just so happened to be low? Maybe. But if we're evaluating, is it convincing evidence, what conclusion can we make? What would we, what would we say? We would say this. We have convincing evidence against the null. We have convincing evidence against the null because 0 0.036 is less than our alpha level of 0 0.05. So I pick the sample that only happens 3.6% of the time and I'm saying under 5% I'm not comfortable. I'm saying I don't know if that claim is actually true. Okay? So what we say is the proportion at the school is less than 0.25. See, because remember, I'm not making a claim about that. I'm making a claim about my school. So is my sample, 3.6% chance that my sample has that, that particular ratio, right? Unlikely, if the null hypothesis is true at my school, all right? So that's how that works. That's how we set up our null hypothesis. That's how we run a significance test. Should look very familiar. The difference is writing those null hypotheses, writing the null and the alternative, and then evaluating against an alpha level, which we've kind of been touching on uh, throughout this year, but we're really hammering it home now. All right, guys, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.